Ashes and bases. Ashes and bases. They have, they're measured on what's called a pH scale. Okay, an acid measured from effectively one, which would be a nice bright red, to six, which would be a yellow or orange. Don't have yellow. In the middle we have neutral, which is going to be a number seven, which is going to be green. And then once we get beyond seven, we have greeny blue, which will be eight, which will be green blue, all the way to a dark purpley colour, which would be 14, that's purple. And this is giving us strong. Weak, neutral, weak for the base. My blue pen is going to be black and strong for fourteen. Just some general names for some of the stuff you'll come across, that you will have come across. Strong acids. Weak acids, things like vinegar. Generally, water, tap water, is neutral. Weak bases, sodium, Bicarb used in baking and things, and strong bases things like sodium, sodium hydroxide, used in getting rid of food stuff in uh, dishwashers and things like that. When we talk about the pH scale, we're measuring colour to give us a number, and this can be done in various ways. There's indicator paper, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, but you can also measure using a pH probe. If we start off with the hydrochloric acid, you can see straight away, nice bright red, indicating we have a strong acid there. Vinegar. So it's a considerably weaker. So if you look at that compared to the chart at the top there, you're probably looking at a four-ish, as opposed to a one for the hydrochloric acid. Water. Green, it's not really changing the color, seven. We have sodium bicarb. That's it. Going for a, a greeny blue, for eight or nine. And the last one, sodium hydroxide. This is a very strong solution. You can see, nice and dark purple. Okay. Other methods, another way of measuring that, is to use what's called a universal indicator. Universal indicator is a mix of different indicators that will give you the wide range from naught, very strong acid, to 14, very strong alkali. You can see if I just put a few drops in, each of them. We get the range. The useful thing to know is that acid and alkali are the opposite of, the, of each other. And if you get the correct amount of acid and the correct amount of alkali together, they will be neutral. It means they form water in effect. If I take some strong acid, add it to the beaker there, as you can see, if I take some alkali and add this a drop at a time and keep swirling it, you 
few drops. Few drops. Hopefully, we should eventually get to the colour of the water at the top there. And obviously, the acid is a lot stronger than the alkali is. That's why it's taking considerably more alkali. But you can see the acid is starting to lose its colour. This is a very useful technique when done with a lot more accuracy. If you look at chemistry in the S3, S4. I can see we've probably gone just a little bit too far there. It's a bit bluish, so it's probably slightly alkaline. Because we've had too much alkaline into it. If I had just a drop of acid. Make it too. Okay. And you see, as I said about the strength of the acid compared to the alkaline there. So if I just a couple of drops of alkali. And this is what's called a neutralization reaction. There. And we've now got neutral. Neutralization reaction. Very, very useful. For a couple of reasons. One. Just put here, neutralization. Oops. Useful. One. Indigestion. If you ever eat spicy food, sometimes you get a bit of what's heartburn, indigestion. That's too much acid in your stomach. So you need to add a bit of alkali to it. Stomach acid, neutralised by things like Rennie or Gaviscon, same idea. Two, bee stings. They're acidic. Okay, so I need to neutralise them. Bit of sodium bicarb, toothpaste, things like that. Which is an alkaline. Three, wasp things. They're the opposite, they're alkaline. Neutralize them by vinegar. Put a drop of vinegar on it. And the last thing, four. This sounds a bit silly, but some soil has a wrong pH for growing crops. So change that by adding a material called limestone. If it's too acid. Need to understand where these things come from. But, ah, an acid. If you look at the formulas there, don't really expect you to know the acids, S2, but HCl is hydrochloric acid. HNO3 is nitric, H2SO4 is sulfuric. And if you ignore the first one, nitric, sulfuric, and almost all other acids contain oxygen and non metallics. So they're a non metallic that's been burnt. Acids are a non metallic oxide. If you look to the other side, same idea. Don't really expect you to know the formulas, but the basis. We have sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide. Now again, they've all got oxygen in, so it tells you the oxidite, ox, oxid, <laughs> oxide, but they've also all got a metal there. So it tells you they are metal oxides. I 
and a couple of quick demos to show this. If I look to burn some sulphur, a non-metallic, I can collect the gas, which is heavier than air, into a boiling tube, add some of the water that you can see down there, which is neutral, nice and green, and we'll see, we should be able to show you this in the city gas. If I set the sulphur on fire, see it burns with a nice lilac flame, hold it into the boiling tube, and the sulphur dioxide gas that we're collecting there, being heavier than air, will drop to the bottom. Okay. So the sulphur is out of the way. If I just turn that off. We have sulphur dioxide gas in there. Add a bit of water. See straight away, it's gone red. So we've made a a weak acid. Okay. So the sulfur dioxide gas, when it dissolves in water, forms an acid called sulfurous acid. It's a bit like the sulfuric acid, but not as strong. Okay, we'll talk about that in a bit. We can do a similar idea with metals. I have here some magnesium. This will burn with a bright flame. I can then put the powder that's developed, magnesium oxide, into the boiling tube, add some of the water, and we should be able to see that that's is slightly alkaline. We don't get a gas unfortunately. So if I put that in there, let it to burn. There we go, let it burn, nice and bright. And then drop into the bottom. Turn my bunsen off. Move it out of the way. So as you can see Piece of burnt magnesium in the bottom. Again, water that's neutral. If we add that in there and shake it up enough, you should see it's a slightly different colour to the actual water. Slightly more blue in there. That's showing that it's slightly acidic. If I keep shaking it, it will get better, but it doesn't dissolve very well magnesium oxide. Okay. So we can see acids are made from non-metal oxides, alkalis are made from metal oxides. One of the problems that we have with burning so much in the way of fossil fuels is that we burn in a lot of carbon. Carbon forms carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, like sulfur dioxide, when it dissolves in water, will give you a weak acid. So we have carbon plus oxygen will give you carbon dioxide. If we then dissolve that carbon dioxide in water, we will get carbonic acid. One of the reasons for brushing your teeth after even fizzy water type drinks, since it's got carbon di uh, carbonic acid in it, which means it's got a pH of about four, which is not very good for your teeth. And that's from burning fuels like petrol, coal. In small amounts in those fuels, you also get some sulfur, as you've just seen. So we've got sulfur, plus oxygen, will give you sulfur dioxide, Excuse my spelling. This when it dissolves in water. Will give you sulfurous acid. Again, pH of about five. This is what we mean by acid rain. These gases have been released over the last few hundred years by humans into the atmosphere, resolving in the rainwater, falling as slightly acidic rain. Not enough to damage you, not enough to damage anything, first, uh, if it were just a very small amount. But over several years, tens of years, hundreds of years, it will start to dissolve rocks. It will start to dissolve statues. It will start to affect 
uh, trees and animal life that live in lakes and things like that. It will start to remove chemicals from the soil, meaning that the soil can no longer support trees, can no longer support the grass life, things like that. And this is a problem. Now, most places these days that burn a lot of carbon fuels have some form of device in place which will remove the uh, acidic gases. But it, we're, still, we're getting, still getting problems from effectively acid rain that were generated 50, 60 years ago. And it's not that big a problem in Britain, but as I'll show you in a moment on a graph, as our winds blow from the west, it takes a lot of our acid gases over to Scandinavia, and we caused a lot of problems in Scandinavia. I apologise for my fantastic map drawing skills, I finished up with an O-level in geography, uh, but you can see what I mean. The wind is blowing from the west mainly, we put in the gas up in our nice tall trim chimneys to get it away from us, and that takes it across to Sweden and Norway where they have real issues with forests effectively decimated and land not being fertile anymore.